my friend RJ has always been interested in puzzles, so much so that it sometimes drove a wedge between him and other people. He tends to get invested in more elaborate ones to the point of obsession, and if you're not as quick to put something together as he is, he can be a bit condescending. Overall I think he's got a good heart though, so I don't mind the occasional assholery. I was sitting in the school cafeteria Thursday afternoon when RJ plopped himself down next to me. He wore that shit-eating grin that said, Ted had just posted a new logic puzzle. So, what V you got for me today? I asked him. Your parents are pretty chill right? He asked back through a mouthful of pizza. I mean, yeah I guess. Depends on what you mean. You think they'd let us go out Saturday morning around 3? I wanna try something out. RJ had piqued my interest and was hamming it up now. He was trying to suppress a smile and act all mysterious but it wasn't working. You gotta tell me what it is first. I said laughing to myself a little bit. I knew he wasn't gonna talk though. He was relishing his little secret too much. He just shrugged his shoulders at me and turned his head back towards his pizza. I'll tell you more this weekend. Friday night came and I got a text from RJ around 10. Don't fall asleep dickhead, I'll be there at 3 sharp. I knew why he was doing this. RJ didn't have a car and relied on me to take him places pretty often. Where he wanted to go at 3am was beyond me though. He's not exactly the kind of guy to get drunk in the woods. By 3 o'clock I was on my second cup of coffee and still fighting to stay awake. RJ showed up at the front door wide awake. Ready to go to McDonald's. He blurted out as soon as I opened the door. I mind slamming the door in his face, which didn't change his attitude in the slightest. I think you finally owe me an explanation. I said, shaking my head. Why are we going to McDonald's? RJ explained it to me as we got into the car. He spends a lot of time on Fort Chong. I don't. Apparently he came across this thread about weird receipts at McDonald's there were a couple pictures included from people who had received these receipts. They all had a number written in red ink at the bottom of the paper. As an aside, I tried to find this thread he was talking about while I went to post this, but didn't have any luck. I don't ever use 4chan though. If anyone can find the receipt pictures and link them in the comments I'd really appreciate it. RJ told me that some people noticed all of the receipts were processed at 3.33 AM on a Saturday. This little detail is what got them thinking this wasn't a coincidence, but might be some sort of big McDonald's secret challenge. Kind of like Cicada 3301 or something. I actually thought this was pretty cool. I knew KFC did something like this with their Twitter account. They sent the guy who figured it out a picture of him getting a piggyback ride from Colonel Sanders. I thought maybe RJ and I could get one with Ronald McDonald if we figured this out. All of the receipts had another thing in common. They had all ordered exactly five menu items. The red number at the bottom of the receipt was always a digit 0 to 5. These menu items differed from receipt to receipt but they were all numbered orders. For example, number 1 was always the Big Mac. RJ explained that this led to them guessing that the numbered menu items formed some sort of code that needed to be input in the right order. And I think I know what the passcode is. RJ said in a dramatic whisper. Look at the receipt with the red 5 on the bottom. He continued. They ordered two number 1s, two number 4s and a number 8. I think those are the digits of the passcode, 11448. They just need to be rearranged. And you figured out the right order? I asked excitedly. I'm pretty sure I did. I just hope no one else has beaten me to it. Well, what is it? You'll see soon enough. RJ replied. His sly grin had returned. I pulled into the McDonald's parking lot. It was almost completely empty. I could see a couple employees and a lone customer inside. There was no one in the drive through line. Just pull up to the start of the drive through and sit there. Don't place an order yet. RJ instructed me. We have to place this order at exactly 3.33. I didn't like the idea of holding up the drive through line. But like I said, there was no one around. So I figured it wouldn't be too much of a problem. We sat in silence for the next couple minutes. I kept my eye on my mirrors to see if anyone was trying to get into line. RJ kept his eye on his phone, watching every passing minute. At 3.32 he told me to drive up to the speaker. We sat there silently for what seemed like an eternity as the poor employee tried to get us to talk to her. As soon as a minute passed, RJ leaned over to my window and placed our order. I'd like a number one. I'll take another number one please. A number four. A number eight. And another number four. We watched as each number popped up on a little screen next to the speaker. RJ seemed satisfied with the results. The employee told us to pull forward. So how'd you know that was the order? I asked RJ. He wouldn't tell me though, 
he just smiled and shrugged his shoulders again. We got our order and paid. The woman working the window didn't give us a little wink or a knowing nod or anything. In fact, she seemed incredibly bored. I handed the bag to RJ and he tore through it for the receipt. There at the bottom instead of a red number was a red address. Holy shit. I muttered under my breath. RJ waved the receipt excitedly at the employee. Is this it? Are we supposed to go here? He asked her. The woman seemed incredibly confused. She looked at the receipt and squinted her eyes. She told us she had no idea what that address was or why it was on our receipt. RJ and I exchanged incredulous glances. Were the employees nodding on this? Who was monitoring it and writing in the red ink? Maybe they were just instructed to play dumb. We pulled out of the driveway and I had RJ put the address into his phone. It was only about a 15 minute drive from where we were, and sure enough it was another McDonald's. At this point I was totally invested. RJ didn't even have to ask me, I was already driving towards the second location. Once we got on the road again it was completely silent. There were no cars or people anywhere on the street. I suppose it wasn't too weird for such an odd hour. Still, something wasn't sitting right with me. RJ seemed to feel it too. The sense of calm. There was no sound other than the purr of the engine. No rustling tree leaves, no overhead planes, no crickets. Nothing. I shrugged it off at the time as a side effect of being so tired, but now I'm not so sure. When we finally got to the second McDonald's, the parking lot was completely deserted. There were no cars, not even for employees. All the lights inside the restaurant were on, but peering through the windows it didn't seem like anyone was inside. That's weird I said as we walked up to the front door. There's no one here. I reached forward and pulled on the glass door, expecting it to be locked. Instead, it gave way immediately, letting off a cheery chime that seemed to linger in the air. Um hello? I called out as we walked into the McDonald's. As I spoke my breath appeared like a thick cloud in front of me. It was freezing inside. Each of our footsteps echoed off the tiled linoleum floor. Is anyone here? Silence. This is so fucking weird. RJ whispered. I'm gonna check the kitchen. Maybe there's someone back there. I wasn't sure if that was a good idea, but he was already leaping over the counter. We should go. I said. I don't want to get in any trouble here. This feels weird. No, wait, hang on. He snapped back. What's that? RJ was behind the counter looking out towards the seating area. I turned around, following his gaze. There, alone on a table in the middle of the room, was a single Happy Meal box. We made our way over to the Happy Meal. On closer inspection we could see a napkin sticking out from under the box. There were two words written in the same red ink. Choose one. I looked back at RJ, and he was just nodding at me furiously to open the box. So I opened the cardboard, and reached inside. There were two small figures wrapped in plastic. Happy Meal Toys. But as I looked at them more closely, a feeling of dread began to settle in the pit of my stomach. The figure in my right hand was short and stocky, while the one in my left was taller and more slender. One wore a green hoodie and jeans, the other was in basketball shorts and a t-shirt. It was us. The figures were so detailed, down to our eye color and shoe brands. They were dressed exactly as we were at that moment. Tiny replicas of terrifying accuracy. RJ reached over and took his figure from my hand. What are? Who could have how is? RJ started asking through increasingly quick breaths, examining his own likeness in the toy. Dude, we need to get out of here. I managed to whisper back to him. I didn't know what the fuck was going on, but I was thoroughly creeped out by the whole thing. This didn't feel like a fun puzzle anymore. I turned and bolted back towards the door, still clutching my figure. RJ just stood at the table, staring at his miniature. Come on man, I yelled back at him, as I threw myself into the door. The door gave way and I was met with a blast of heat. The silence seemed to crack as I crossed the threshold outside of the store. A train blared in the distance. A dog barked across the street. I could hear cars driving along the highway in the distance. A slight breeze scattered some leaves across the tarmac of the parking lot. It was as if the whole world collectively breathed out a sigh at once. I turned back to RJ. The store was completely dark. There were no lights on inside. RJ was gone. I was frozen in shock. I was standing inches from the door I had just come out of. A door that now seemed to lead to an entirely different place. I finally came to my senses, and pulled at the door again in a panic, trying to get back inside. Maybe RJ had just moved somewhere else, I thought. Surely he was right inside somewhere. However, the door wouldn't budge this time. It was locked. 
I was completely beside myself at this point, calling out to him in a frenzy, and banging on the glass door. After a few minutes of screaming, I had to stop and catch my breath. I sat down on the sidewalk in front of the door. I tried to stop myself from shaking and calm myself enough to analyze what exactly just happened and what I should do next. That's when I looked back down at the toy in my hand. It wasn't me anymore. It was a small replica of Ronald McDonald, but his eyes were pitch black. There was a little speaker on his chest, and a button on his back. I threw it on the ground in sheer disbelief. As it hit the sidewalk, the toy let out a grainy whisper. Good choice. Now start running. As I pulled up in front of the shop, I had to recheck my directions. It was a dingy little hole in the wall stuffed between a Dollar General and a computer repair shop. It looked like it had just existed here since the creation of the first VHS tape. The windows were covered in thick yellow paper, and the outside was caked in a film of old dirt. The sign on the door said open, but it was barely visible through the dirty window. There was no way this place had what I wanted. When I was a kid, I remembered watching a show on cable called Children of Man. As a kid, the premise of the show appealed to me. The show was about kids living on an island out in the Pacific, trying to survive day-to-day -day trials. The producers had gotten 40 kids from all over America, ages 10 to 12, and dropped them off with supplies and instructions on how to survive. The host, Chris Mansworth, was a survival expert, and he would create challenges every day for the kids to complete. There were four teams of 10 kids, and the winner of each challenge got something cool for their area of the village. I watched the show religiously as a kid, every Saturday night. Right after The Simpsons, the show would come on, and I would be enthralled. I always imagined that I was on the island with them, surviving day to day. The challenges were always neat too. They had the kids gut and clean their own meat, dig wells by hand, build rafts for the raft race, and make aqueducts so their village could have running water. It was a neat idea, but the show just stopped after 8 episodes. No new episodes came out, and the station never gave a reason. This was before the internet and there was no way to check for updates online. So, the show slipped off into obscurity, and my 10-year-old self just forgot about it. I remembered the show again a few years ago when mom sent me a box of my stuff from the attic. There were a couple of old VHS tapes in there, and between Batman the Animated Series and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were eight tapes with handwritten labels that read Children of Men. We had a VHS recorder when I was a kid, and I can remember recording my favorite shows to watch later. I was excited to get to see the old show again, the memories flooding back, and I started looking for a VHS player among the tapes in the box. There wasn't one, but a quick trip to Goodwill and $15, and I had a gently used VCR hooked to my TV. I watched all eight episodes back to back and fell in love with the show all over again. I remembered the kids I liked. Robert and Catherine were my favorites, but many of the kids had also been given a lot of screen time, and it was hard not to like them too. As I watched, I found myself wanting to see how the show ended all over again. As I watched the show again, I began to notice something a little darker under the surface, too, something I hadn't noticed as a kid. The village was divided into four teams, green snakes, blue birds, red foxes, and brown mice. The teams had mostly been divided up by background, which seemed very divisive to me as an adult. The green snakes did most of the hunting for the village, a lot of their kids having a rural background while the brown mice did most of the farming and gathering because they came from a farm background. The red foxes were in charge of construction and upkeep, they were the smarter kids, and they worked with the blue birds, who were in charge of food management and cooking the meals. Every team had a representative who sat on a council. Robert sat for the green snakes, Catherine for the blue birds, Marco for the red foxes, and Shireen for the brown mice. As the show went on, it became apparent that Robert didn't trust Marco, and with good reason. Marco and Shireen had formed a kind of alliance of their own though most of it was because Marco bullied her into doing what he wanted. Robert and Catherine set up their own alliance, and Robert started holding out food to sway Shireen's decisions. The village needed food, and Robert pointed out that he and Catherine were the ones providing it. Robert and Catherine wanted a fair split for everyone, but Marco tried to split them into a class system that would put his foxes in the higher tier. Robert didn't like that, and it became clear that if Chris hadn't been there, we would have seen a lot more fights. Robert was a big 12-year-old, a stocky bruiser who won battles with his fists most of the time, and Chris had separated him and Marco more than once. Marco was smaller but definitely had charisma. He had most of the mice and all of the foxes on his side, and I wasn't sure how I missed all this tension as a kid. It all came to a head in episode 6. 
Marco was caught hoarding food in the Red Fox Village. It wasn't just food that the other teams had been bringing and eating. He had been taking the comfort foods from the canteen the brown mice ran for the village and storing them in his hut. Robert discovered this and took Marco prisoner, demanding he be placed on trial. The whole village was in an uproar, but Marco agreed to be confined to a central cabin until the council could rule on his trial. Chris was setting the whole trial up as an episode 8 draw for viewers. At the end of episode 8, the council found Marco guilty, and the episode had ended with a lot of shaky camera work and the Red Foxes storming the podium where Marco was seated. That was how the show had ended. The little bell chimed overhead as I stepped into the tiny place. The store looked like a throwback, sharp-looking rickety shelves that were covered in plastic VHS boxes and thick dust. The shelves held VHS tapes, Beta Max, and DVD cases that were arranged neatly amongst the filth and dust. A quick look showed that they were all in alphabetical order like some ancient library. The shelves fronted onto a glass display case that held murky wonders within. On the counter was a television, an ashtray stacked with old butts, and the greasy store clerk who smiled at me as I approached. You the one who called about the tape, he asked, showing a mouth of stained teeth. I had searched for months on my own. I had taken to the internet in an attempt to find something, anything, that would give me some closure. Wikipedia told me that only eight episodes were aired, but twelve had been intended. As I dug deeper, I began to see that the show was a mystery all its own, though. The list of children that had been in the show was woefully incomplete. Marco and Robert were there, so were Catherine and Shireen and Chris as the host, but none of the other children were even named. No one, except Chris Mansworth, had gone on to do anything after the show, and his only contribution was his death a few months later. His wiki said that he had committed suicide in his hotel room, and foul play was not suspected. As for the last four episodes of Children of Man, however, there was no mention. So I took to the usual online sleuths. Reddit, 4chan, TV message boards, no one seemed to have the answer. Most people had never even heard of Children of Man, and the ones who had were more interested in my copies than the last four episodes. Apparently, the episodes were never compiled or released for purchase, and the only means by which the show still existed was on VHS tapes like mine. I had several offers for them. One guy wanted to give me $500 per tape, but I declined and told them I'd post copies of the tapes here for free if they wanted. That's how I met Charleston Hammer 462. He was a user on the hometown board of Reddit. He saw my post and the posted videos and got in contact with me about the place I was currently in. Heard you were looking for a certain tape. In my line of work, when you're looking for something, you go talk to Reggie. He owns a shop in Burlington, South Carolina, called Video Time Capsule. If you need a banned episode of a 70s drama or a never-aired documentary from the 60s, you talk to Reggie. I read the message a few times before responding. Thanks, Charleston, but these episodes aren't just unaired, they're unknown. No one has ever seen them. I don't even know if they exist, and the store you're talking about is over 400 miles away. I figured I'd never hear from him again when I hit send on the message. It took him an hour to respond. What you're after is very rare. I used to watch Children of Men myself when I was younger. It ended so abruptly that it's been an internet mystery since the net was just wells and message boards. I didn't learn about the last four episodes, though, until I met Reggie at TV Con. We got to talking about old TV shows and, after a few drinks, he told me that he had the last four episodes of Children of Men. That piqued my interest. Have you seen them? That response took a little longer. I have, it's some pretty different shit. I won't ruin it for you, but if you value the way you remember Children of Men, then don't watch it. There's a reason these episodes never made it to air. Here's the number to the store. If it's late, call him anyway. Reggie keeps weird hours, and sometimes that store is open 24 hours. He's an eccentric dude, don't doubt, but he has what you're looking for. The number was at the bottom of the message. Yeah, I said, no longer sure about what I was doing, yeah. I called you about the complete series of Children of Men. He nodded, reached under the counter, and slapped a plain white case on the counter. All eight episodes, recorded at airing, he said, his eyes studying me. I frowned, I'm after the last four episodes. His piggy eyes glinted behind the grease-smeared glasses, there were only eight episodes that aired. And you told me that you had the other four episodes that never aired. He smiled, and it did ghastly things to his poor sign face, had to be sure. Come to the back, and with that, he disappeared behind a curtain, into the back of the store. I walked around, hesitating for a moment as I touched the curtain, and followed him. I'd come 400 miles, I might as well go another 5 feet into hell. 
the phone rang six times. I was just about to hang up when someone answered and spoke through a mouthful of food. I didn't understand him, but once he'd swallowed whatever had been in his mouth, he tried again. Video time capsule, where your memories are always on sale. What a tagline. Yes, I was looking for something specific. The sound of something being stuffed into the speaker's mouth and loud chewing assaulted my ears before he continued. Aren't they all? What y'all looking for? Clearly, customer service was not their strong suit. Episode 9 to 12 of Children of Men. I heard something hit the floor, and the speaker cursed loudly. Yeah, uh, you must be mistaken. There are only eight episodes of Children of Men. Look, I said a little hotly. I was told that you have things that no one else does. I want to see these episodes. I don't even want to buy them. And I was told that you have them in your possession. Is there any way that I can just... $500, the voice returned, and the tone was not one to be bargained with, in cash before I will even let you see them. I agreed, despite the outrageous price, and now I was here in this grungy shop prepared to go into the back. The back was worse than the front. DVDs and VHS tapes were stacked in teetering piles. The back room was lit by only a few dingy overheads, and I could see an old TV casting its glow from the back. The floor was riddled with trash and I swear you could hear the mice scampering around to get out of my way. What sort of videos could I find here? Would this place give me anything but heartbreak? This seemed like the setup to a thousand scary stories, and I suddenly didn't want to see these mysterious artifacts. But like anyone else who comes this close to finding the thing they want, I needed to see them. Reggie was waiting for me on the TV. He had an ancient set that looked very similar to the one my parents had owned. On top was a VHS-slash-DVD combo player and a set of rabbit ears that stuck out like a weather vane. There was a wooden chair in front of it with a little blue pad in it. Reggie held his hand out. 500, he said. How do I know it's authentic? Look, I could get in a lot of trouble for even owning this, okay? You think guys who possess child porn go to prison for a long time? This would put me under prison for life. If you want to see those episodes, then I need the money. Are we doing business here or what? I handed him the money, and he popped the cassette tape in and walked away. Not joining me? I asked. Not for another $500 bucks, kid. I heard the curtain rustle as the show began. Episode 9 gave us a recap of the trial and then the storming of the stage. When the show started, I noticed a distinct lapse in film quality. Whoever was operating the cameras was much shorter than their usual crew, and they seemed barely able to handle the heavy rig. Finally, the camera had Robert into frame and he began to fill us in on what was happening in the village. It's been about three days since Marcos's trial and his escape. Since then, Fox Village has been separated from our village. They took most of the brown mice with them, and now they try to raid us every night for food. Something is going on over there. We heard shouts this morning, and... But at that point, the shouts got louder, and Robert ran off screen as the camera tried to follow him. We came to the edge of Red Fox Village. Many of the huts that were once on the verge have been burnt out, making a kind of barricade between them and the rest of the village. Many voices were cheering as something swung from the tree. At first, I thought it was an effigy, a dummy maybe, but then I realized that it was Cherine. She swung like a grotesque wind chime in the space between the villages, and Robert shouted for Marco to stop being a coward and come out. Some of the kids were crying, but everyone on the other side cheered and shouted, traitor, or faithless, at the swinging body of Cherine. I sat, glued to the TV, unsure if any of this was even real. It was night when the next recording resumed. It seemed that whoever was running the camera wanted us to see a raid. The night vision on the cameras showed kids with torches fighting other kids who were leaving their storehouse in a hurry. The kids with torches hacked at them with machetes, blood flying as they connected, and some of them dropped as they were stabbed or hacked to pieces by the blades of the other children. The rest of the episode was mostly uneventful. Lots of shaky cam, lots of crying, and at one point, Someone dropped it and didn't pick it up for several minutes. As the episode ended, I was left looking at my own stark face looking back at me. What had I just watched? There was no way that could be the same show. Things had gone very Lord of the Flies in the village, and as the 10th episode started, I wasn't sure what to expect. Episode 10 started without a preamble. There was no recap, no theme music, and the footage looked unedited. We see a much more professional camera crew and Chris Mansworth trying to bring some order back to the island. They are coming up through the shallows, Chris and about ten adults, coming up in the dark towards the village. Chris was talking about how this had gotten out of hand and how they were going to try to rescue the children. As they came into the seemingly empty village, Chris cupped his hands and began to shout at the empty huts. 
He told them that the game was over and that it was time they went home. He told them there was a boat that would take them home. Still no response. He moved deeper into the collection of straw huts, the fires burning low around them, and that was when they struck. Kids with spears and machetes came screaming out of the darkness, and the cameraman backpedaled furiously as the adults were taken completely by surprise. Blood flew, legs were sawed off as the pint-sized savages hacked and chopped, and Chris Mansworth was buried under a pile of children as he screamed and flailed. As the cameraman tripped and went down, we saw the shadows of children standing over him as the spears came down. The episode ended abruptly. I was speechless. What the hell had happened to them? These were kids that had been doing challenges and making friends. The rivalry between Robert and Marco had always been the most serious part of the show, but now they had devolved into savages. The 11th episode was about 10 minutes long. It opened on a stationary camera shot of the same space they had held the trial. Marco was on his knees before the camera, and he looked bad. His left eye was a puffy mass of bruised tissue. His left ear was a bleeding stump. His nose looked to be cut jaggedly. He was weeping silently, and his tears were thick and bloody. Robert stood behind him. He had always worn a white football jersey in every episode I'd seen him in, but the garment was stained red and brown now. He bled from several places on his chest, and when he raised his machete, it was with obvious pain. This morning, before the sun had risen, this dog attempted to attack our village. He violated the rules of war as agreed up by him and I. We agreed to a battle between our two villages at dawn. This snake tried to attack us in the night and lost. Thus his village is forfeit. As the winner, I sentenced him to death. Please, Robert, Chris Mansworth's voice can be heard off screen, the show is over. You can all go home now, back to your parents. It doesn't have to end like this. As Marco cried his terrible tears, Robert looked at Chris off screen and turned back to Marco. The show is over. This is our home now. He brought the machete down. Marco cried out and fell face first to the ground. Robert fell on him, hitting him with the machete again and again. Blood sprayed from the struggling child, and when Robert looked back to the camera, his face was splattered in gore. He reached out, and the camera went off abruptly. The last episode was only a few minutes long. It started with the shaky cam journey through the jungle. The runner was being pursued. I could hear the footsteps behind him. As the runner got to the shore, he jumped into something and pushed out into the water. The wooden deck of a boat came into view, and as he drifted out, I could hear oars working in the water. He sat the camera on the seat, and as he rode, the faces of children could be seen in the surrounding jungle. Then everything went dark. The tape clicked, and the TV went back to static. I left it in the VCR and stumbled out of the back room. Reggie was sitting behind the counter and looked up at me with something like sympathy. He held something back towards me, and I saw it was my money. I shook my head and stepped away from him. I had bought a ticket, and I had paid the price. You gonna be okay? He asked. Yeah, so what happened to the kids? They just left them there? Reggie shrugged, the Coast Guard picked Chris Mansworth up two days later. He was drifting in the ocean and looked extremely rattled. He wouldn't tell them how he had gotten out there or where he had been. When he got back, he gave the tapes to the studio, and the next time anyone saw him, he was dead. And the kids? The studio never pursued the show. They never sold the aired episodes. They never even tried to air what Chris brought back. They just made the whole thing disappear. I suppose there's an island out there, full of kids who went to be on a TV show and never came back. Their parents were likely told they had been in an accident or something. The whole thing was hushed up, and eventually, people forgot. You'll forget one day, too, he added, as though it might help. As I lay in bed now, trying to forget the horrible things I saw, I hope I do forget but I doubt I ever will. So if you happen to find an island out in the Pacific, maybe one full of locals that just don't look right, turn your boat back out to sea. Those natives are not friendly. Hi all. I've been listening to and loving Let's Read for a few months and figured this was a good place to write down some interesting things I've experienced as a resident of the good old Rainbow Nation itself. I'd like to start off by saying South Africa is a beautiful country with lots of amazing features, but if you ever consider coming for a visit it's best you practice vigilance. Crime is pretty hectic here, 
and everybody in South Africa has either been a victim or knows a victim of some form of crime, from the most horrendous to the pettiest. This is where I'd like to start my story. Now I'd like to warn everyone that there is mention of harm to animals so please proceed with caution. Now, I live in a very safe neighborhood for South African standards. We have a very efficient security team or neighborhood watch that volunteers with the police, and usually arrives within minutes if there's any trouble. Every house is lined by gates and walls, these being on average about 6 feet tall and most times topped with electrical or barbed fences. This is actually the norm for South African properties mind you. This neighborhood was also pretty secluded with one main road, and the only reason for someone to come deeper into the neighborhood would be to access the houses. However, despite all this protection, there are always at least a few break-ins and hijackings that occur every once in a while and sometimes it builds up into a larger operation that usually ends up hitting the whole neighborhood quite severely. I was in high school when this particular big bang hit. It was one of the most grim incidents as the plan involved getting rid of the first line of defense, which was sadly dogs. Unlike my family, some people keep their dogs outside at night, especially if they tend to be a bigger breed. These dogs barking madly are usually the first to alarm the street if someone was wandering around in the middle of the night, which in turn would rile up the rest of the dogs in the street, and residents would immediately be on the lookout for any strange behavior. So a vast operation began. They started out by using an insect poison called aldicarb, otherwise known here as two-step, as a rat will take two steps after eating it, then die. As you can imagine, this stuff and its effects are not pretty at all. It's so severe that not only will it kill animals if ingested, but it can harm humans who have merely handled it. They took this two-step laced inside cold meats and sausages, and threw bags of the stuff into as many yards as possible, hoping that if the dogs didn't sleep outside and eat it that night, that they would still find it the next morning. For two weeks we started receiving warnings from the security, noting that sadly already seven dogs had died from ingesting two-step and that the criminals responsible were likely planning a big hit. And hit they did. I woke up to a scream at about two in that night. I jumped out of bed and threw myself to the window, looking down into the garden, seeing my dad swinging a metal pipe at nothing or so it seemed to me. Backtrack a few hours earlier, a woman down the road had called the security, noting a group of men wandering into our street at about midnight, and when the security arrived, they had scattered into people's yards to hide. My mom had received a phone call from our security team, alerting her that there was a lot of suspicious activity that night and they, alongside the canine unit of the police, needed to check inside our yards to try and track the men. They did a sweep and found nothing, then moved to the next house. That's when my dad had gone out with my beagle, Hatchy, as he definitely wasn't sleeping after that and wanted to investigate himself. Bearing in mind the security and police were still crawling about in the house next door, so it wasn't unsafe so to speak. He grabbed a torch, picked up a pipe he had lying around and was wandering around with Hatchie in the backyard when suddenly she took great interest in the wheelie bin that had just been emptied out that morning. It had a large crack down the bottom and she had her nose shoved in there taking deep wafts, only to yelp in terror when the bin flew open and out jumped one of the men, dashing past my dad who had screamed in anger trying to hit the guy with the bar as he ran. He ran so fast across our yard that it took him one leap, with the help of our poor old potted lemon tree, for him to scuttle up the wall over the electric fence and onto the roof next door. It might sound insane that he managed this feat, but an officer later told us if these guys weren't criminals they'd be Olympians for the stunts he's seen them pull. This was the scream that had woken me up. My dad immediately started yelling to the security next door that he had found one of the men and told my mom to call the neighbor whose yard the man had jumped into. Some of the security raced back to ours to see if they could spot him over the wall while the police were led in through the gate at the front by our neighbor to find him. He was spotted and surrounded, jammed ramrod against a wall on the roof, still as a statue as if he wouldn't be noticed, even with the giant spotlight now trained on him. My mom, two siblings, and I watched from the upstairs window as neighbors, security, and my dad started this guy down as the police wrenched him from the roof and into handcuffs. Everyone was furious, not only was he one of the men trying to break into our homes, but they were killing and harming dogs to do it. It all went quiet as the largest officer I have ever seen came through the crowd and approached this man. I later learned that he was head of the K-9 unit, and I think his reaction was pretty reasonable. He faced him for a few seconds, almost sizing up what kind of monster would kill dogs in such a horrendous way, then punched the man so hard he flew. Nobody spoke as they picked him up and took him to the van outside. We were later told the only reason they didn't put him in the back with the dogs was because of the crowd of angry residents that had now formed on the street. Pity. They carted him off, 
along with the four other men they had caught in other yards. My dad later found a bag of poison next to the pool in our yard, luckily untouched by Hatch, and the police had taken it away wearing heavy-duty gloves. He was then instructed to douse the area with as much water as possible to get rid of all traces of it. The neighbors whose roof the man had jumped onto had luckily noticed quickly that their dogs had ingested poison and had to take them to the vet to have their stomachs pumped, and they thankfully ended up being okay. The neighbor himself had also had to go to the hospital as he had touched the foam coming out of his dog's mouth which had traces of two-step and made him sick too, he was also okay thankfully. That was all about five years ago, and I'm thankful we haven't had any more severe instances such as that, but I know the men they caught were most likely only the lackeys of a bigger operation, and although we seem to have nipped it in the bud that night, I know that most likely won't be the end of it. I hopefully won't have to update y'all on any new instances anytime soon. So this happened to me when I was still in high school, well really just starting high school. I was around 15 to 16 at the time, and it was early June. Me and my friend, who we will call Jessica, decided to sneak out and hang out around our bus stop, which was only about two blocks from my house. I get out of the house just fine, and start walking to hers. Now I'm not big into superstitions but, as I'm walking to her house a black cat runs right out in front of me, to the other side of the road, keep that in mind. So I made it to her house and let her know I'm there by a text. The time is around 4 a.m., and she comes out with a few beers and I bring the bottle opener. We walk to the bus stop with no problems, just chatting about school and how excited we're for the rest of the summer. We drink beers and walk through the neighborhood for probably an hour. Now we were both pretty buzzed because we were kids and didn't have anything to do with alcohol at the time. As we were walking back to her house to depart for the night, a black sedan drove by on the main road while we're walking down a side road. I didn't think anything of it at the time, so we kept chatting until I noticed the same car had reversed back to look down the road we were walking on. At this point I told Jessica to just pick up her pace because I noticed this. Now the car is slowly driving down our road, probably about half a football field away from us. I start to notice the sound of the car speeding up. Luckily we were now turning onto Jessica's road. I'm telling Jessica to jog so we just look like morning joggers, we speed up turning down her road. We're about three houses away from hers. The car or the person in the car doesn't see us turn down this road and speeds right past us. We slow down to catch some breath. Suddenly the car does the same thing as before, reverse to the street we were on and started to floor it. At this point me and Jessica are sprinting to her house. We weren't going to make it, so she pulls me into the yard of a neighboring house and we hide behind the bushes on the side. We watch as the car drives up and down the road several times. We waited about 10 minutes before thinking we were okay. Wrong. All of the sudden we hear a car door slam and the faintest of whistling. Not just some happy light tune, this was a dark sinister whistle. The whistle is getting closer and closer until it suddenly stops. At this point me and Jessica are holding our breath as to not alert the person of our whereabouts. I'm not sure how much time had passed but it felt like an eternity. We finally hear the car door again and watch as the same car drives away. I instantly get up and walk Jessica the rest of the way back to her house. Now I have to walk home alone after what had just happened. I honestly just wanted to hide behind those bushes until daylight, but I had to get home or my family would notice, as they were early risers. So I booked it to my house, being stopped halfway by the unpleasant sight of what I assumed was the same black cat. At this point I'm running even faster than before, and I fall, scraping not only my knees but also my forehead. So now I'm thinking, how am I going to explain this? I made it back to my house without noticing anything unusual. Now I made a huge mistake by turning on my light in my bedroom, letting whatever that was out there know exactly where my bedroom is. Which is on the front of the house, the person put two and two together and what I assume was them had started knocking on my window about 20 minutes later. This only lasted for a little while because the sun was already coming up. But it sure did have me hysterically crying thinking I was going to die. That morning I woke up to my mom taking all of my electronics including my phone, and was grounded for the rest of the summer. The moral of the story is don't sneak out. For those who are familiar with my unsettling neighborly encounters, I have a mix of both terrifying and, somewhat, encouraging updates to share. On Monday, my super came to replaster my bedroom ceiling. First, he said that my neighbor told the contractor she has a lot of plants because she makes bush medicines. She's also told him that dancing is a part of her professional practice as a healer for people who are in bereavement after the loss of a loved one. 
so my friend and I weren't far off when we made the connection between her ecstatic dance and compassionate death affiliations. I showed him new cracks in my living room ceiling that are growing in size and number by the day. He told me to send videos of the cracks to building management, but management suggested I start with a handwritten note by their door explaining how their behaviors are wreaking havoc on my life. Since the super was working in my apartment, my neighbor was actively bumping music plus jumping. I wrote a note in which I requested she reduce the volume of her music and be mindful of the intensity of her activities. I explained that the jumping or dancing was causing significant new cracks in my living room ceiling, and I offered for her to speak with me directly if needed. While I was reluctant to suggest this, I knew she might try another stalking trick if I didn't give her the option up front. So, I sent the note. After 90 minutes, my super said he had to leave for an hour while the plaster dried, but he would be back soon. Of course, my neighbor chose the end of this time frame to come down, when I was alone. When I opened the door, she again had the biggest fake smile and said, hi, then waved the note. First of all, she said, I want to thank you for your open communication. That is so important and so rare in our city, fake flattery. She admitted that she dances, which she has to do for her mental health. But she claimed that she only dances in the mornings for 30 to 60 minutes slash 90 minutes max. I knew she was lying, so I said that her actions are affecting my mental health. She followed up with a range of excuses, including that they have been in the process of rearranging furniture, unpacking boxes, and they sometimes watch movies in the evening with their loudspeakers. I showed her the cracks that were immediately visible from the doorway area. She pointed to one and said, see we used to have one table over there, but now we have two due to the furniture rearranging. So maybe that's the reason? We also have cracks in our ceiling and, you know, we all have to share this space. I asked her about hosting any large events in the past month, which she flat out denied. She briefly mentioned that she does sessions, but didn't elaborate further. The following suggestion, I later realized, was entrapment. My neighbor said she would give me her phone number, go upstairs slash lower the volume, then I should text to let her know if I could still hear it. Thankfully, my super came back while she was in the process of sharing her contact information. She immediately tensed up, quickly gave the number, and then scurried off. As she passed my super, she randomly blurted out, we're best friends now, referring to me and her. My super and I are both very aware of the antics, so of course he didn't buy that manipulation tactic. I texted her that I couldn't hear the music now, to which she responded, so glad to hear that. Thanks again for opening a line of communication, I'm always happy to chat. Hope you have a lovely day prayer hands plus a heart emoji. In retrospect, I think she wasn't playing the music at all. I also felt like our conversation was riddled with gaslighting, misdirection, and flat out lies. I was somewhat confused, but I know what I've been experiencing and have plenty of evidence to prove it. Within hours of our conversation, my neighbors started up the loud music plus dancing as if nothing happened. I was furious. I took new audio recordings and immediately emailed building management with my new evidence, footage of the ceiling cracks, along with the photo of my note. I explained that my neighbor was kind, though somewhat misleading, and expressed interest in accommodating my requests. I also said her behaviors were continuing as normal despite the false claims that she would take my experiences into account. The building manager said to keep her updated but it was clear she assumed the situation would be resolved on its own. Nope. My neighbor continued with the incessant bass heavy music plus jumping shenanigans the next day, and the day after. I continued to document everything. On Wednesday evening, I went out for a quick errand and again was a victim of the stalking tricks. She ran into me as I was entering the building, waited until I passed her on the stairwell, and then spoke up. She acknowledged that I've probably still been hearing her activities the past couple days and that I will continue to hear them for the next few days, all due to rearranging furniture. She said the coffee table had been sold that day, not true, I was working in my living room all day and would have heard such a commotion in the stairwell. I said yes, I've been hearing her loud and clear. Shortly after this in-person encounter, my neighbor went on to host a party. I heard people in the stairwell who seemed unfamiliar with whose apartment they were even visiting, and one guest introduced herself as a friend of someone else. While the music was much lower, the group began running back and forth overhead. Hearing these strange activities without the music was somewhat creepier than with the music. I took more recordings, then retreated to my bedroom. But of course, the group decided to migrate to their patio, right above my head again. By 10.30 p.m., I had enough. They were no longer dancing, but the group's chatter along with ethereal music, a female soprano singing vocalizations, 
was too much. I sent her a text. I explained that I understand she has every right to host guests in her space, but I was perturbed by the way she'd said to my face that any excess noise I might hear in the coming days was from rearranging furniture. I said I could hear music and conversations very clearly, as the noise filters through my AC unit. I also said to please let me know if they will be hosting events in the future so I'm not caught off guard. While my neighbor didn't respond that night, within minutes of my sending the message, the group began to sing the happy birthday song in the most somber way I've ever heard it sung. I was able to record the second half of it, they sang in a monotone, and there was no clapping, cheering, or any standard signs of merriment that occur after singing the song. The following afternoon, my neighbor sent me a wall of text, in which she continued to lie. She said that the gathering was very small, only four friends, so it didn't even cross her mind to let me know when she saw me earlier. She also said it was the first time they had hosted more than two people over this entire year, I honestly had to laugh at that. She said when she first saw my text, they lowered the music volume and told the friends to quiet down. So, she admitted that she saw my message, but made no mention of any birthday affair. As for the furniture rearranging, she explained that it's been part of a longer-term project, smiley face, and added more lies like how they had just received a dining table and bookshelf they'd been waiting on for eight months. Not only would I have seen such large packages in the stairwell, but also why share so much irrelevant information if being truthful. Finally, my neighbor said that they will be hosting two more events next week, another small gathering of four friends next Wednesday in honor of her partner's birthday and a larger gathering on Friday, again for his birthday. Like I said, she made no mention of singing happy birthday the night before. Who would host three birthday parties over two weeks? It was all false. She followed up five minutes later with the second text that explained she was late to respond because she's been in back-to-back -back sessions. So, I finally had written evidence of her talking about these sessions. I didn't respond to the text. I refused to engage her or her partner any further. They continued to play music and stomp around that evening, but I had my BF and a friend over who heard everything and validated me that all of this is absolutely maddening. On Friday, I finally called my building manager to explain everything. She needed to understand that something very strange and potentially dangerous is going on above me. Thankfully, I finally believed it. It turns out my building had no idea that she was running some form of a business and hosting group events, I thought they at least had a vague awareness. The building manager said they would get the attorney involved ASAP to review their lease contract and pursue action. She asked for all my evidence, including written communications, a personal written account of verbal communications, audio recordings, and footage of ceiling damage, I've been taking videos of the ceiling cracks over the past few weeks to demonstrate how quickly they have grown. I made a Google folder that divided each category, dated every piece of evidence, and sent. I was so relieved. It felt like some form of action was finally in motion. I assumed the building attorney was working on a case against them over the weekend, so I ignored their relentless music plus jumping. But today, Sunday, my neighbors have been hosting yet another gathering since 11.30 a.m. I've been hearing heavy bass, sporadic jumping, and chatting on their patio for 7.5 hours now. While I've continued to collect my evidence, I decided to wait until tomorrow to check in with management. Around 5 p.m., I was quietly sitting on my couch when out of nowhere I heard the door open from above, someone jogged down, and then pounded on my front door. I didn't move a muscle. The person on the other side waited for about a minute, I thought I heard keys jingling, and then they slowly retreated back upstairs and shut the door again. Honestly, I have no idea what's going on now. The music plus jumping increased after the knocking incident, maybe they were testing if I was home, but I'm rattled by how I'm feeling when I'm minding my own business. At the same time, I want to keep laying low to protect myself. I still have very little information about this group. They are clearly escalating, three events planned within one week, despite added pressure from everyone around them. This happened to me back in 8th grade and I didn't remember it until my cousin brought it up. We went down to a beach for my aunt and uncle's anniversary. My cousin was more than happy to invite me along with him and I was more than happy for a week at the beach. But as luck would have it, my aunt and uncle's anniversary turns out to be in the middle of February, so I realized that we decided to bring our Xboxes. We made it to our hotel safely and due to some booking issues they sent us to a sister hotel they had. 
now I say hotel, but it was really a motel in a kind of crummy part of town. We got there to drop off our bags and settle in when we were on the third floor. We're there for no less than an hour when we get a knock on the door. My uncle checks the peephole and opens the door, and it's our first official interaction with the crazy neighbor. At first she seemed nice, a little pissed but nice. She politely asked if we could keep the noise down so we obliged and closed the door. I understood where she was coming from. It was late at night after all, the rest of the night was normal. I crashed very quickly. I woke up to my aunt making breakfast. Everyone talked about their plans for the day, since me and my cousin weren't gonna go swimming we decided to go and walk the strip down the beach. My aunt and my uncle had already left shortly after breakfast. While me and my cousin were getting ready, we got a second knock at the door thinking it's his parents. I went to check the door and it wasn't my aunt or uncle, it's some lady. I thought about the lady from last night and figured it could be her. When I opened the door, she looked very irritated. I could tell whatever she had to say wasn't good. I didn't even get a word out before she spoke to me. I came up here yesterday and I already asked you people to keep the noise down. I'm standing there confused on what to say cause honestly we weren't making much noise at all. I apologize to the woman and she stands there for maybe another 5 seconds looking at me then leaves. I told my cousin about it and we shared a laugh and finished getting ready. The day was filled with random stores after random stores. After a while naturally we got hungry. We both had our own money to spend but in the interest of saving it we decided to order it. Going back to the room we turn on the TV and try to find a pizza place. While this is going on we are trying our best not to make noise to avoid another encounter with this woman. We knew she would throw an absolute fit if she had to come back up again. Well we figured out what that woman's last straw was, so our pizza gets here and we start to eat pepperoni if you're wondering. While getting ready to eat I hear absolutely furious footsteps coming up the stairs, clearly sensing something is not normal. I go to look out the peephole and of course it's the crazy neighbor. I call my cousin over to look and he does. He's freaking out asking what we should do, and while he's talking I'm looking through hole again and I can't tell what she's doing but she's looking down. I look at him and just tell him I'm going to talk to her, but then something happened that made me realize what it was she was doing on the other side of the door because as I go to turn the lock it turns by itself and I'm standing there amazed at the fact that this woman unlocked the door. Standing there shocked sure didn't slow my reaction time cause as soon as it hit me I locked the door and took a step back. My cousin looked just as shocked and as scared as me in that moment. We collected ourselves and I looked back through. She was still there and she knew we had to be inside cause she started saying through the door, I know y'all are in there open the door I just want to talk. After 10 minutes she left. We didn't know what to do scared she would come back and try to open the door again. We got our pizza and ate by the door. We called my aunt and uncle and told them what happened. They were shocked to hear and rushed home from dinner. They came home and we told my uncle what happened and the police called when the police arrived. They came up to talk to my uncle, and one went down to talk to the neighbor. After the cops talked to the neighbor, they came up and told us the reason she was so angry was because we were stomping going up. We were stomping up the steps. We had to explain to the cops and his parents that we were in fact not stopping going up. We came to the conclusion that it must have been when the pizza guy was walking up the stairs since it happened right after that. And as to how she was able to unlock the door, we figured out that one key opens every door, and it also turns out the woman lived at the motel. It was hard for me to go to sleep that night. I was afraid the woman would come back. I mean one key that opens all doors. That's insane and extremely dangerous if it falls into the wrong hands. We slept fine though, and went home the next day. I know that probably wasn't as scary as people were expecting it to be, but in the moment it sure terrified me. That was the first time I realized how people can go from 0 to 100 real quick. I don't know what that lady was planning on doing if she got in but honestly I never want to figure it out. So crazy neighbor, who tried to break into my room to do god knows what do me a favor let's never meet again. This story happened to one of my best friend's uncles. My friend recounted the event after he met his uncle during one Christmas vacation where they had a huge family gathering. They ended up sharing scary and creepy stories between the family, until his uncle, seemingly uncomfortable, decided to tell him. To put you in context, my friend was of Italian origin, and his family moved to Canada in the 80s. His parents and their siblings lived in rural Italy near Medina, if I recall. They didn't live in the small city but a few kilometers close to it on a farm. The farm itself and the land surrounding it was really vast and calm, nothing even remotely creepy ever happened there. My friend's uncle, let's call him uncle for the rest of the story, 
at the time had one of those vintage really small motorcycle slash bicycle hybrids which you could just pedal with, or start the engine and drive it for a bit with a very limited fuel tank. Uncle had a very strict mom, and every night had a curfew of 10 p.m. on top of everything else. In order to escape the house's sometimes heavy atmosphere, he would drive his little bike to the city, do a bit of sightseeing and drive back home before 10 p.m. The way leading to the city was a very isolated farm road, with about half a dozen farmhouses in between, half of them being abandoned. So he would use his motor up until Medina, where he'd switch it off, and pedal through the city in order to not bother anyone with the wheezing sound of his old school vehicle. One night, after driving up there and settling in a park to read a bit, he just fell asleep. He woke up in a daze, with the already calm city being pitch black and devoid of any signs of life. He panicked a bit checked the time and it was almost 11 p.m. He of course tripped because he knew it meant bad times back home but thought he was better to rush back there still than arrive even later, so he pedaled as fast as possible toward the city's edge where I planned on switching on his motor to drive the rest of the way faster. Almost immediately after leaving the park where he was, he noticed a tall, cloaked or hooded figure in an alleyway crossing the main street he was riding on. He was taken aback a bit, but mostly concentrated on going back home as soon as possible. So he just rushed past the person, kept on straight, and after a few seconds he had a feeling of being followed or watched. When he turned his head around, he was scared straight to see the cloaked figure following him at a very stiff and surprisingly fast pace. First thought he had in the rush of things was that it might have been a cop, or a disgruntled local that was pissed to see a kid riding his bike in an otherwise extremely calm city. So he picked up his pace, and started to ride his bike quite fast, when he noticed the person was now all out running after him but as he described, with a very weird, lanky way, but super efficient. At that point, he was legitimately scared, and shouted at the figure to leave him alone and that he was just trying to rush back home, to no reply whatsoever. Nearing the city's edge and about one kilometer from the farm road leading to his house, he just decided to switch on his engine to the risk of awaking some people because he was just too afraid of the person behind him, who was still running maniacally after him with no signs of slowing down. When he switched his engine on, he just gunned him for a good minute or two with a sigh of relief, seeing a distance growing between him and the figure. After a few minutes, he just had to stop to take a breath and relax a bit because he was really shook, and did not want to get back home panicked on top of being past his curfew. So he stopped, put his bike on the stand, and just tried to get his act together. Then, after maybe 30 seconds, he started to hear a weird stomping noise in the distance. At this point, he was in absolute total darkness so had a hard time figuring where the sounds were coming from, but he knew for a fact that it was getting closer. So he just jumped on his bike and switched it on, which turned his front light and his rear red light on to illuminate the way. He frantically looked around to try and spot what was making the upcoming noise, couldn't see anything in front, and then he turned around to see if the rear light could help him see anything. He saw the cloaked figure that ran after him in the city rushing toward him in the distance, running on all fours. Uncle described it as a rabid dog just pouncing full speed in his direction. He never felt that kind of fear, confusion and straight up horror before and after. He was able to snap out of his state of shock just in time to fire the engine, gun it and just drove as fast as possible for an hour or so, way past his house. At this point, he just wanted to get away from this creature. He told the story and seemed extremely uncomfortable reminding most of it, but almost had a lump when describing the last part. At one point a few years back, I ended up working in a small, privately owned restaurant. It was set on a small main drag in a tiny, historic community. The restaurant definitely stood out amongst the locals and tourists due to its multicultural food variety. The restaurant served everything from American cuisine to Indian, Thai, French and Middle Eastern foods. The small restaurant was formerly a popular, privately owned Chinese restaurant and a local favorite. But unfortunately, the older man that owned and operated it passed away inside the restaurant one day, so suffice it to say that the local townsfolk didn't take too kindly to the foreign city woman that bustled in shortly after his death and purchased his restaurant. Not only was my former boss flaky and irresponsible, but she could also come off as quite curt and rude at times. So, she had a rough go at first obtaining the proper permits and what not in order to renovate the historic building. The thing is that when you do certain renovations in an old building like that, the local laws require you to then update a lot of other things that could be quite costly. So that meant that she decided to just use the staff that she'd hired, which was us, to help her with most of the renovation work. Everything was going pretty smooth, you know, nothing out of the ordinary. That is until one overcast, 
drizzly day when we were all gathered in the dining area for a staff meeting. As we all sat there quietly, listening to the boss lady, something a little strange happened. The front entrance door to the restaurant suddenly opened about halfway and then carefully closed after a second, as though someone had simply stepped in. Of course, there was no one there as the door was almost entirely glass and we would have seen a person on the other side. We all looked at one another confused, but we just chopped it up to be the breeze since the back door was open, though there was a set of closed kitchen doors in between. The second odd thing to happen, happened to another employee when she was there alone one night. According to her, just after she turned a corner passing a shelf with some tools on it, an empty cordless drill case went flying past her head. It barely missed her and smashed into the wall in front of her. She definitely seemed pretty put off when she told us about it in the kitchen the next day. Following that, random small things would happen here and there. Like, our boss would ask us once in a while why one of us didn't come into her office when she'd see one of us walk by her open door, but we were usually puzzled by that, as none of us had ever even walked past her office during that time. Besides that, we'd get the occasional strange sound, like a faint voice or a door opening or closing. Also, when I'd be in the kitchen putting together some ingredients for a recipe and I'd have to walk away for a second to go grab another ingredient off the back shelf or something. But when I'd return less than 15 seconds later, one of the ingredients I'd set out prior to leaving the area would be gone. I'd end up having to measure out and prepare the same ingredient again, annoyed. But I had no idea that it was about to get a lot more terrifying for me. The final thing to happen to me and my other co-workers was the worst experience I ever had that was paranormal hands down. But, in order to properly explain this part to you, I'm going to need to explain a couple of things about restaurant kitchens to you. In a typical restaurant kitchen setup, you have a cook line and the cook line is literally that. A line is in a skinny walking or standing space typically between the oven, fryers, and cooktop with the prep surfaces and small fridges on the opposite side, leaving about a 3-4 to four foot walking aisle forming a cook line. Besides that, there's a dishwasher outside of that line, followed by the rest of what you'd expect to find in a restaurant kitchen. You know, like fridges and freezers all on a large scale. You also got your giant hood fans above the cook area and a hot water heater. The reason why I point all those out is because together, they all constantly make noise. Think like loud or ambient background noise constantly. So one day, there were three of us working in the kitchen. Me, my boss, and another employee on the dishwasher. My boss and I were on the cook line, while the dishwasher was a few feet away from the cook line. We were all three working as normal when all of a sudden, it got quiet. Think of when you don't realize you've been hearing a constant low sound until it suddenly stops and then you notice the sudden change in the noise environment. Except for I mean it absolutely got dead silent. Almost like an invisible soundproof blanket got thrown over the three of us. As soon as I noticed it, I looked around at the other two and they also looked puzzled. What the hell? I questioned out loud. Why is it so freaking quiet all of a sudden? Asked the dishwasher guy, suspiciously. I don't know, my boss replied, drawing out her words nervously. She turned to face me, as I was standing directly behind her on the narrow cook line. Nora, go make sure that the fridges and hood fans are still running, maybe the power is out. So I ventured the ten or so feet to outside the cook line area and weirdly enough, I could hear the hood fans and even the dishwasher, hot water heater and all the fridges and freezers running like normal. I went back to my boss and with a confused look, told her everything is working fine. That was the first creepy part of that, but when I stepped back onto the cook line to tell my boss, all was silent again. Well Nora, get back to work grilling those peppers. She snapped. So I got back onto the cook line beside her. After a couple of minutes though, I suddenly started to get tunnel vision and I felt really dizzy and nauseous. I told my boss and she told me to go sit out back for a few minutes and get some fresh air, which I promptly did. As I was sitting outside trying to feel better. I could see my boss go into her office, which was a kitty corner from the back door. Since the back door was open with just the screen door closed, I was able to hear her while she made a phone call. She sounded urgent and shaky as she asked the person on the other end of the line to please bring in an abalone shell, some sage, and some kind of weird oil. Now, the reason she needed those particular items was because according to her, she had felt something walk through her on the cook line that wasn't good. The shitty part is that I was standing right behind her inches away on that cook line. I waited for her to finish her phone call and return to the cook line before I went back in. By the time I got back in, everything sounded normal again on the cook line. When I got off my shift about an hour later, believe me when I say that I made the normally 45-minute drive home in just under 30 minutes. All night that night, 
I tossed and turned, unable to really sleep. But, the few times I managed to slip into sleep, I kid you not, I got jolted right back awake because I would see a screaming demon-like thing right in my face. Just as some background, the place where this happened has a crime rate 1.3 times higher than the US average, including a heightened amount of violent crimes, and is known for human trafficking. I won't go into too much detail here as to how I ended up in this city, however, I wanted to shed some light on how dangerous living in this area can be before I dive into my experience. Also, for clarification, I am a woman. When I was 19, I had a very bad smoking habit. The smell of cigarettes makes me feel sick now but back then, my camel blues were something I couldn't do without. At the time, I was living in what I will loosely refer to as a group home, for anonymity's sake, located in a neighborhood just a few blocks from a little corner convenience store. I would often frequent this store as that was the closest place to pick up a pack of smokes. Usually, when I went to pick up more cigarettes, a few of the other young women from the group home would come with us, as we were all friends and enjoyed each other's company. The afternoon of this experience, I asked my friend Amber to tag along, even though she didn't smoke. She agreed and together we made the 10-minute walk to the corner store. I purchased my pack of smokes without issue, and Amber and I started our walk back. As usual, the streets were pretty much deserted, and we didn't see any pedestrians or cars on the way. Every moment of this brief interaction comes back to me with perfect clarity, despite five years having passed since we experienced this. Amber and I had turned off, walking down a deserted side street, parallel to a closed-down Safeway, locking us from view from any of the houses in our neighborhood. When we reached the corner, about to cross, a car drove up with two men inside, both staring at us. Locking eyes with the man on the passenger side of the car, I knew something wasn't right. As every woman has, I had previous experiences with old creepy men before, so I shook it off and kept walking. Turning the corner, the driver of the car stopped, putting the vehicle into park not ten feet away, leaving it in the middle of the road. Amber and I both froze as we saw the two men exit the car, the engine still idling, and both car doors left wide open. I remember the determined look on both of the men's faces. It was almost predatory, calculating, cold. Just writing this out makes me feel nauseated and anxious, my nervous system reacting the same way now as it did that afternoon. There's something about the body language a threatening person exhibits when they have ill intentions. It's hard to describe, but the posture these men carried themselves with as they advanced on us is seared into my memory. I truly felt like prey at that moment. Something in my gut was certain that we had to get away from them. The two men never took their eyes off us. They did not call out to us and they did not speak to each other. Not when they spotted us in their car, not as they exited their vehicle. Looking back, that is what scares me the most. This was planned ahead of time, and from the efficiency of their actions, I can only assume they had done something like this before. They must have been following us since we left the corner store, maybe even spotting us before we went in, we just weren't paying attention. Panicking, my fight or flight response kicked in, shaking me from the temporary paralysis. Glancing around desperately, I saw two familiar people come into view at the far end of the parking lot across the street, down quite a ways. I grabbed Amber's hand. Run! I shouted, pulling her with me as we spirited away, the two men close behind. Maya! I yelled, using my free hand to wave desperately to get our friend's attention. She and her boyfriend were looking at us, confused, as we reached them. Turning around, I saw that the two men had jumped in their car and sped off. At the time, I guess Amber and I both just shrugged off the experience. We didn't talk about it or tell anyone, except to explain breathlessly to Maya why we had come sprinting over. Honestly, I cannot believe our luck. What if Maya and her boyfriend hadn't been walking down that road at that time? Would the men have kept up the pursuit? What if one of us had tripped? What if those men had decided to follow us home, which was only a few blocks from where they tried to abduct us? What if they had succeeded in kidnapping one of us? Sometimes, I catch myself imagining all of the worst-case scenarios we could have ended up in. Part of me wants to know what those men had planned, the rest of me is just thankful I'll never have to find out. I was still incredibly naive at that age but looking back on this as an experienced adult, I realize how fortunate we were to have gotten out of that situation unharmed. Hello all. I'm a 28-year-old female, 
so this story is from years ago. Please enjoy reading this as much as I had sharing it. Let's just say my name is Jenna for the story's sake. I haven't been back to the same place since and I always shared this story with my friends. It has become a favorite, whether they believe me or not. This is somewhat of a throwaway account because I don't want to be pinned down to where I am. I usually visit my family's cottage up north, not going to disclose specifically where for privacy reasons, every summer and on the occasion on July 4th, Thanksgiving etc. It's a waterfront cottage, facing a lake, surrounded by a dense forest. It's located on a private beach, so you see your neighbor every once in a while. Everyone comes up north around the same time so it wouldn't be uncommon to have a chat with others and thus, everyone knows each other and subsequently, their business. My cottage sits between two others, one is inhabited quite frequently and one is abandoned, to my knowledge. My family and neighbors know that a European family, possibly Polish, German, etc., owns it. I just assume that they hold on to the property to maintain some sort of tangible asset in the United States. Back when I was young, around the ages of 18 to 20 my cousins, brothers, and I would get away from our family to smoke weed in the abandoned cottage to avoid any sort of scolding. It was fun, an empty cottage with some furniture that was a time capsule from the 80s. We would peer around and look at the old brown love seat, the dark den, the main living room adjoining the dining area and the cute little kitchen with old wine glasses laying around. It was resoundingly acknowledged that others have been through the abandoned cottage as well. There were smoke joints on the ground, footprints, old beer bottles with modern labels and furniture was always moved around from one position to another. However, the cottage was never spruced up, it was never clean nor organized. So we knew that the owners weren't coming by, it was random explorers, perhaps other teenagers, doing the same thing we did. Upon some curious investigation, we saw a basement. We opened the door and saw a staircase that led to a floor that was pure dirt looked like a cellar from what I could see. I stood at the top of the stairs looking down and saw exposed brick, nothing particularly interesting. Of course we would freak each other out, saying someone lives down there, that there was a serial killer living there, or there was a corpse collection buried under the dirt floors. So, none of us would go down there with our independent conviction, it would have to have been a dare or a display of bravery. One day, around Thanksgiving, four of us, three girls, and my brother, went to the abandoned cottage to smoke some joints and gossip about family. I don't see my cousins much, only during special occasions, so we sat on the tables in the dining area to smoke, chill and chit-chat. Of course, the topic of the basement came up. We laughed and talked about who would go down there, who would most likely survive the serial killer living beneath us waiting for his next victim to enter his abode. We turned and noticed the basement was unlocked and this was unusual, since it was always locked. The one occasion where it was unlocked was when we took a look, or one of my brothers would go down there to freak all the girls out and prove his macho, so to speak. We would always lock it afterwards, purely out of the feeling of some sort of reassurance. We chalked it up to other teenagers just like us having visited the cottage before us, and all of us girls made my older brother get up and lock the door. He stood, looked us all up and down and jokingly said something along the lines of, You guys are just pussies always get a man to do the scary thing for you. We laughed, but he was the guy, if there was someone down there, he would be the most likely to defend himself. He's a big guy, 210 pounds and 6 inch 5. He took maybe three steps before there was a knock, it sounded like a knock on a hollow surface. Considering that this cottage was quite old, I thought that it came from the side of the building. I don't think there's any significant insulation that would prevent an audible knock. I instantly looked at my brother, who looked smug. He said, You know, if you ask me to do something for you, don't mess with me whilst I'm doing you a favor. I looked around, waiting for one of the two other girls, my cousins, to fess up and mock his masculine courage. It seemed like everyone was resoundingly confused, anxious and waiting for the same thing. I guess my brother saw their reactions and did not see mine and concluded that I was the source of the suspicious knocker since my back was turned to him. Very funny Jenna. You think you are such a joker. My brother said with a chuckle. I turned to him, and I guess he saw my anxious face as well. I guess he could read me well. I thought that maybe him walking on the old floors unsettled some of the structural integrity of the building. Maybe it was one of our parents messing with us. I didn't think it was from a foreign source. I quipped at him 
just go and lock the door. He continued walking toward the door but it opened slightly, he stopped dead in his tracks immediately. We're going now, the hell with that freaking door, one of my cousins sternly said. We all got up from sitting on the tables, we gathered our things including weed, beer bottles, and phones. We quickly ran to the front door, not daring to look back. My brother was the last of the anxious conga line that was created by the bottleneck of the lone exit. I heard significant footsteps coming from the back of the cottage, I thought it was my brother, and I turned back and I swear to God I saw a hand opening the basement door. Oh my God! I yelled, there's someone in the freaking basement. I managed to shakingly say after running down the stairs that led to the front door. What? Everyone else said. My brother looked back, holy shit. He held onto the sides of my arms to push me to go faster. Go, we heard a foreign voice say. We ran faster, dropping bottles, pipes, and shoes. We ran so fast that our flip-flops flew off. I knew it wasn't any of us. Not even one of our parents, it was a low, stern voice from afar, my brother was right behind me. We made our escape to our cottage thoroughly flustered and terrified. There was a homeless guy in there, I freaking saw him. My brother, out of breath, managed to say. I guess it was common knowledge that the place was abandoned, I wouldn't neglect the possibility of someone taking refuge there. I don't know if the guy went into the basement when he heard us coming then got tired of sitting on the dirt floor then scared us. I don't know. It's a private beach, so you would have to know of the specific location to be able to understand how to get there then also know that there's an abandoned property as well. I also know that there are squatters. To offer a further explanation, people share on Reddit that there are certain locations in our area where you could set up camp on a vacant lot and take a day to sit on the quiet beach. But I know that neighboring properties crack down on it pretty quickly and let them know that they can't settle there. I thought that would have been a good explanation. We ran to our parents after proactively hiding our wheat stash, our priorities are certainly well placed. And told them our story, they called the police and we watched from afar to see what the hell was going on. I guess the guy left. The police came to us and told us no one was in there, but they let us know to file some sort of report regarding the abandoned nest of the cottage. I think there are some sort of laws that demand that the owner should be using the cottage and executing upkeep. None of us really cared for being the Karens of the situation, so we never filed such a report. At the end of the day, I understand that some people just want to have assets, whether they're shitty or not. It would suck to lose out on good property in a nice location. I think they might come back one day since our neighbors know of the family. No one else has ever filed a report to my knowledge. I guess the experience didn't shake up my brother too much since he went back and gave me details. He found some dead squirrels and baby raccoons just laying in the living room. He said they looked quite fresh. I think that they died of natural causes but. How do two different species of animals just die in the same place? I asked him if they were mangled or obviously killed in some way and he said no. He said the baby raccoons had fur. I did some research and I know that baby raccoons aren't born with fur so I deduced that they were alive for some time then somehow died in the living room. I don't want to know if something or someone killed them there. Or maybe killed them in another place and then brought them in there to give some sort of message to any oncoming visitors. I hope it isn't the homeless guy. I'm going to preface this by saying, I was incredibly naive. My best friend, Jay used to work at a restaurant in a very bad area. She had moved there from our little suburb about 35 minutes away. I still lived in the suburbs with my parents, so my street smarts weren't the best. This was three years ago, I was 19 at the time, so driving around to visit friends was, and is, one of my favorite pastimes. One day, I decided to stop by the restaurant to see Jay, as I'd done it a few times before and I was friends with all her co-workers. My friend was busy and she made me wait around with a few of the others for a bit until her break, then came to chat with me. At this time, I was very anti-purse and just kept a wristlet, a little wallet you can keep around your wrist. After chatting for about 30 minutes, I left the restaurant and walked back to my car. After driving for a while, I noticed I had left my wallet, so I texted Jay telling her to grab it from me and where I had probably left it. I already knew there was a possibility that it was gone being that I had left it in a busy restaurant in Center City, and Jay confirmed it was indeed gone. My dad cancelled all the credit cards, but I was still holding on to hope that it would be returned, 
as I did have my ID in there. The next day, I got a text from Jay. She tells me someone called the restaurant and said they had my wallet, and that she had given them my number. I was really happy about this, but knew I would have to meet up with the stranger, so I decided not to tell my parents. I didn't get a text until the next morning. The person said that they had my wallet and wanted to give it back, but never have a name or description. I didn't care, I thanked them profusely, and asked when I could meet them. Hours later, they replied with an address and told me to stop by around 9pm. The address was about 20 minutes from the restaurant, which was also a really bad area but that didn't worry me as I had left my wallet right around there. I got there around 9, and this is when I started to get freaked out. The house looked like it was previously a row home, but the one connecting it to the rest had been demolished. The windows were boarded up, and there were no lights coming from inside. The place was obviously abandoned, grass overgrown, weeds everywhere, graffiti all over it, you get the idea. The door, however, was not boarded up and I could see it was ajar. I texted the number, and the person replied a second later telling me to come in. It was early summer, so while it wasn't completely dark out, it was getting there and I would have needed a flashlight to see. So what do I do? Well, turn on my flashlight, of course. I get out of the car, and look around in hopes of seeing someone. Nothing. So with the phone flashlight in hand, I start walking up the dry rotted wooden steps to the front door. I crack the door open further. It's completely black, and when I shine my flashlight around, I can see there's no furniture. I thought I heard some quiet creaking from the upstairs, which I thought was strange. Why would the person text me to come in but then be hiding upstairs? At this point I knew there was something wrong here, I was scared as hell, and I hightailed it back to my car. I should have pulled around the corner but I didn't, I just called the police right there. Two policemen arrive shortly after, and walk right into the house with flashlights. Then two more pull up. They were inside for a long time, then they came out. With them, in handcuffs, are two skinny, scraggly, homeless looking guys. I only got a good look at one, but I do remember the guy had visible sores on his face and arms, I assumed they could be drug related. As the cops walked them by my car, one of the guys looked in at me with the angriest expression I've ever seen. Two of the officers came over to talk to me, and had indeed found my wallet inside. All the money was gone, but the rest was intact. The cops reprimanded me for being so stupid. I drove home and never spoke of it to my parents, only recently have I told them what happened. I'll never know what those guys were planning. Was it just someone messing with me, and I called the cops on two random homeless guys living there? I never got another text from that number. I started carrying a purse after that. Gross creepy abandoned house men, let's never meet again. Ever. I work in food service, front of house, so, in the early days of the pandemic with restaurants closed, I was taking work wherever I could find it. An old friend clued me into a medical office that needed someone to come in and do a bit of light filing. I was able to go in at night to limit direct contact with people, so I jumped at the opportunity right away. Ironically the medical office job had been the safest I'd gig been offered thus far, COVID wise. I wanted to avoid the bus if I could, due to crowds, so decided to swing for a rideshare app. It's not all that expensive in my area and I really didn't want a virus. I headed in at almost 3 a.m. because it was after the cleaning crew had left. I was kicking myself for being so cautious, though, because I was exhausted. I stumbled onto the block looking for my ride and to my tired self's great relief the car spotted me almost immediately and pulled up asking, Uber? While I cluelessly wandered up and down the street searching. The ride was taking a while, but I'd only just moved here last year so I'm not familiar with all of the surrounding areas and thought nothing of it. I was pretty alert at first, so I was trying to pass the time playing games on my phone and stuff. But the car didn't have a compatible phone charger and I wasn't sure the building would have one, so I wanted to save my battery to be able to call a ride back. I shut my phone down into airplane mode and eventually drifted off from a combination of tiredness and boredom. I don't often take rideshares so being alone with a strange driver often put me a bit on edge but this guy had a pretty boring car and a very standard look about him, he looked a little like my brother even. Young, clean kept, listening to jazz, nothing that screamed you need to micromanage this trip. 
When we arrived the driver tried to wake me up by calling to me from the front but I was in too deep of a sleep and couldn't fully distinguish it from my dream. Finally he awkwardly jimmied my leg to wake me up and kept saying, Mayam, Mayam, we're here now. I was embarrassed that I'd gotten that out of it so I just hurriedly said, thanks, and booked it out of the car and into the building. As I looked around I began to realize nothing was what I had expected of an office park. I had seen a street view of the building when I first looked up the business and it had appeared to be a strip mall plaza. The further I went the more loudly alarm bells were ringing in my gut. The structure was semi-dilapidated and it was pitch black dark past the entryway. I expected some lights to be off in the nighttime, but not to the whole building. I skittered across the concrete foundation comprising what was left of the lobby area told myself they must just be renovating, and followed signs for the stairs. After what felt like ages but was likely just a few minutes, all I had passed was construction equipment, a couple locked doors, and some smashed windows. I was certain I was not going to find a medical office and figured maybe I had mixed up the address. I took out my phone to double check, but once I got it out of airplane mode, I could barely get a signal. I kept moving around in the building, pacing, looking for a stronger signal. I eventually confirmed in my text that I had written down the correct address just by scrolling back, which didn't require service. Since I had only been inside for a few minutes at most, I figured I should try and get in touch with the driver, because if I entered the correct address then it was only fair he should continue my ride to the correct place and save me the added fees of calling a second trip, considering this was all his mix-up. The app was taking forever to load with my slow service, but before I could get to a cloud of reception. I heard a rustling sound in the lower level of the building. I was on the top floor and the only stairwell I was aware of was the one I had taken up, so it would force me into the middle of the building. There was no way to exit the situation without encountering whoever was downstairs. In an abandoned building in the latest hours of the night I figured the chances were high that it was a tweaker, and I had no desire to try slipping past a tweaker, especially when it was late enough that they were probably on something, so jumpy and on edge. I tried to get a text out to a group of friends with my address and a request to call 911 to help get me from the property because I didn't feel safe walking in that neighborhood at night and didn't have enough reception to call a new ride but the message wasn't sent. Reception was too weak. So I gave up on getting my phone going and started checking for another stairwell, or even a window with balconies or dumpsters that could be used to exit the second floor as a last resort, in the event whoever was downstairs came upstairs. I scrambled over to a door with a stairs sign on it, but the stairs were completely dilapidated and it was essentially just a straight drop down to the first floor. At that point the worst case scenario began to unfold. I heard whoever was downstairs begin making their way up the stairs. I thought fast and figured based on my walk about the floor was basically a giant loop, so I would have to wait for whoever this was to come up the stairs, wait for them to come all the way up and then sprint the opposite direction of wherever they were going and try to get down the stairs and out of the building in time to make it to the road without encountering them. I was not anticipating being chased or anything, but didn't want to piss off a druggie or have a homeless person who might be living there feel as though I trespassed and become hostile towards me, or have any sort of interaction that could possibly occur at that hour in an abandoned industrial park. I held my breath for what felt like 5 minutes but was likely closer to just 30 seconds and the person appeared at the top of the stairs. To my great relief, it was just the Uber driver. I figured he had come back from me, realizing he had left me in the wrong spot, a place that could have worked out to be dangerous. So I came out from the beam I was hidden behind and started to wave him down. But then I processed there was no way for him to realize this had been the wrong address. My stomach lurched forward and my blood chilled to slush. I made eye contact with him very briefly and he was completely calm and composed, but breathing pretty heavily, and blocking the stairwell down. On a normal, rational, day as an outside observer I could think of a dozen innocent reasons he might have returned, but in the moment, standing across from him, I just knew in my gut that this was someone with ill intent. I can't remember much more from the ensuing few minutes. Operating solely on muscle memory and instinct I superman dove for the second stairwell's opening and just let myself fall down the drop. Thankfully I don't think he'd seen where I'd gone at first, and though I was in too much pain to know it then, plenty was bruised but nothing was completely broken. I scrambled up and threw myself at anything that seemed like it could be the door. It was too dark to tell, I was disoriented from the fall, 
and I wasn't in a calm enough mindset to think to use my phone flashlight, plus, in hindsight, some part of me probably knew it would call too much attention to my location. Just before I was able to reach the door, it flew open with the blinding light beaming straight into my eyes. My first thought, though not totally coherent, was, there's another one of these guys, A-A-H-H. And I stumbled backwards, trying to find something to hide behind. Before I could, a voice called out, all right, this is the name of town police department, everyone get on your knees with your hands in the air. I didn't believe it was the police at first. I was in such a fight or flight mode and had already committed to flight that I continued looking for ways to get out. But he kept shining the flashlight right at me as I teetered around and yelled, hey, I sat on the ground right now. Hands out, hands out where I can see them. He sounded so authoritative that I just automatically did exactly as he asked. He approached me and finally shined the light away from me. It took a second to get my night vision but once I did I could see he was really a police officer. I tried to explain what was happening but first he started asking me all these questions and that, combined with what had just happened, and my fear of the driver coming back, all snowballed into my being unable to form a single articulate sentence. He was even asking easy questions like, can you tell me your name? Do you have any knives, needles, or anything that could poke or cut me? Would you rather talk here or outside? And my total stunned babbling in response at first led him to believe I was onto something. He directed me out to his car, and once I was safely out of the building, I was able to start getting my bearings just a little. I sat on the edge of the back seat of the squat car, with the door open facing out, while he stood across from me and asked the same questions again. The first thing I could think to ask was, did my friends call you? What did they tell you? And he explained no, nobody called him. He was patrolling the area and noticed a car idling outside of this building that's known to be condemned, and nobody's supposed to be inside, and, when they are, they're not up to no good. He was launching into a speech about how if I'd gone to shoot up or meet a John he had resources he could direct me to and that this was not an ideal place to do either of those things and asking if I had somewhere safe to stay that night. But I was stuck on something else he'd said. Finally it all clicked. The car. I spilled my whole rideshare story in a frantic word vomit. He looked around and the car wasn't there anymore. The officer guessed the guy had driven off while we were talking inside the building. He asked me all the details I remembered and I told him, but there weren't many. I'd been too tired when the ride started to track much. But the officer realized I could pull up my Uber app and get all the information. There wasn't really enough reception there, even outdoors, so we sped down the road and once I had enough bars the app roared to life and I had four missed notifications from Uber. They said, hello, I've arrived, and I don't see you. Can you confirm the pickup address is correct? And I'm flashing my hazards. And finally, unfortunately your driver had to cancel. At first I thought the driver was so cunning as to pick me up while sending these fake messages and canceling so the GPS wouldn't track us, knowing I wouldn't notice because I was asleep with my phone off and exonerating himself. But instead I checked the car details, checked again, and it was definitely not the same driver. The person who'd driven me there had not been my Uber. My driver was somewhere else on the street when this guy pulled up to me. The policeman took my statement and said they would keep an eye out for the guy, but the best I could give them to go off of was basically, young-looking Caucasian man with brown hair, sideburns, goatee, and four-door sedan, wearing a zip-up sweatshirt. Maybe I had a hood, which is, like, one out of every four guys in this city. I feel so blessed to have survived this near miss. Suffice it to say, I do not take rideshare services anymore. Quadruple check your license plate and driver name. You just never know. This happened over 20 years ago. I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve, and my mother's family used to hold a large celebration at my aunt's house in Estacada. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting with my extended family, but she got on quite well with them. We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking an assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had been quite inebriated by the time we had to leave. Therefore, I'd be driving us home. It was around 11 p.m. or so. 
I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forest, and parts of it are unlit. But nothing to fear, I grew up in this area, so I knew this road like the back of my hand. The both of us were just driving and talking away, just two young lovers making the most of our moment together. There is a portion of the highway that descends down an enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road are thick forests. There are no lights. The only thing we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drive down the hill, cross the bridge, and uphill through more forest. It's as the highway starts to flatten out that it happens, something sprints across the road so suddenly that I almost hit whatever it was. I slam on the brakes. I turned to my girlfriend and asked her if she saw it. She confirmed that she had but she couldn't make out what it was. Maybe it was a coyote, as they are a fairly common sight in this area. But something felt off about it. Whatever it was that ran in front of the car disappeared into the woods next to the road. Coyotes don't usually just dart out in front of cars. Not like that anyway. So for some reason, I decided to check it out. I turned the car around and switched on the high beams to better light up the forest in which this thing had vanished. I step out of the car, and walk towards the woods. I don't see anything. But now it feels like perhaps I'd made a grave error. My heart is pounding, and the hairs on the back of my neck are standing at full attention. But I still don't see anything unusual in the trees. Suddenly the car's horn blasts. It's not a beep 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 that you get if, say, your driver or passenger wanted you to hurry up and get in the car. No, this was a long blaring beep. I walk back into the car, and ask my girlfriend why she leaned on the horn like that. She said nothing, instead, she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I looked over in that direction, and that's when I saw it. Surely this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It was a man. He was completely naked. His skin was covered in dirt and mud. And in one of his hands, he was holding a hatchet. He looked back at us. And then, he smiled and waved to us just before turning around and walking back into the forest. Needless to say, we got the hell out of there. Once we were safely driving again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I was trying to look for the man in the area he initially vanished in, he circled back around and came out from another spot in the forest, beyond my car headlights. My girlfriend had seen something out of the corner of her eye, and that's when she saw him. Before she honked the horn, he was walking towards me, his hatchet raised as if making to strike me. We called the authorities once we got safely back home, but they never found anybody, or they did and just didn't tell us. But the officer we spoke to explained his theory. The man was obviously looking to ambush unsuspecting lone travelers for the Lord only knows what reason. We all agreed that my girlfriend's quick thinking saved my life, as it let my potential killer know that I wasn't alone out there. I moved back into the area recently, so I now drive that highway often. No naked hatchet man sightings yet, but I can tell you that I'm definitely extra vigilant now, especially near Deep Creek. This happened to my very close family friends on Christmas Day a few years ago. I used to babysit for this family starting around age 12, and I later house slash dog sat for the months at a time all throughout my 20s. This story is particularly creepy for me because I have spent a ton of time alone at their house. Main story. So this family is enjoying a stereotypical Christmas Day evening in the family home. It's winter and so it's dark very early. It's a drizzly, wet, foggy night outside. It's a large family and the kids are all grown, in their 20s slash 30s, most with jobs out of state, but everyone has come home to be together for the holidays. Siblings are busy playing with Christmas loot, TVs are all on, Christmas music is playing, food is being cooked and eaten, and there's a lot of laughing and talking. This goes on for many hours. The youngest daughter spots her dad standing in the middle of the courtyard outside in a black hooded sweatshirt. The hood is over his head so just his mouth and chin are visible and he's just looking in at the house. She casually calls over to her mom, who's in the kitchen, to go check on dad because it seems like he needs help with something in the yard. Except mom says dad is in the bedroom taking a nap. Mom and sister quickly come to the realization that there is a creepy total stranger in a black hoodie just staring in at them, not moving, on Christmas Day evening. As you can imagine, the family collectively shits enough bricks to build another chimney for Santa. They proceed to alert everyone in the house run around checking the locks on the many many sliding glass doors and windows, and wake up dad. In the meantime, Black Hoodie Creep can see everyone's movements because the house is pretty much completely glass window walls. This guy continues to just stand there in an intentionally creepy, Jason-like, pose, not moving, except now he has a sinister smile on his face. It's obvious that he is enjoying being caught. At first the family thinks it might be a practical joke, 
the family members start to call out things to intimidate him like, if this is a joke, it's not funny. We already called the cops. We have a gun, but the guy just keeps standing there, smiling and not moving for a long time. Then suddenly, he rushes up to the glass and starts pounding on it, not saying a word, his face still obscured by the hood. Obviously, he is intentionally trying to scare everyone, if not break into the house, and now the family really does call the cops. After pounding on the glass for a good while, he runs and hops the fence near the home's trash cans and heads to the neighbor's yards. The neighbors are also good friends, so the family calls to let them know what is happening, but they never see the black hoodie man. The cops arrive within minutes, take the statements, check all the neighboring houses, but never find this guy. Not long after, the family had their courtyard area completely remodeled, including a new security and light system. The scariest bit of this story, for me, is that they have no idea how long this guy was just standing there watching them enjoy their Christmas. Bonus Details the home where this took place is in a quiet upper-class neighborhood. It's a square home with an interior square courtyard situated on the edge of a steep hill with a busy six-lane road below. It would be very difficult to climb this hill and scale the back wall to access the back porch area and even harder to escape down without falling into the traffic below. It would also be hard to exit the neighborhood, unless climbing through people's yards, without being spotted by the cops. The home is angled in such a way that the wind blows right through it causing creak slash drafty sounds on even mildly windy days. A rustle or crunch sound would most likely be ignored. The home's layout is similar to many traditional Japanese homes, with sliding doors attached to each section of the house, leading to the square middle courtyard, except rather than wooden panels or screens, this home is all sliding glass window hallways. If someone is in the central courtyard at night, it is very easy to see into all areas of the house without being seen due to the reflection of the lights inside, however the courtyard does have some dull footway lighting. Home is beautiful, but they have some creepy art, including stone statues of children playing in the courtyard and a collection of cringe clown art that was so popular in the 80s. Also their senior dog used to growl intently at empty hallways in the middle of the night, probably was just blind slash deaf but still freaky. I was often unnerved while sitting for them, even before this happened. Home has a floor to roof iron front gate, impossible to climb over, and a wooden gate, possible to climb, leading to trash and storage slash adjacent to neighbor's wooden fence. These are the only access points to the central courtyard. My conclusion. This guy was a crazy ex slash old school friend playing a prank on one of the, now adult, kids, but years have passed and it was never revealed so this seems unlikely. Another conclusion. This guy had some mental problems and slash or was possibly a peeping Tom type pervert and was just having an episode. Lastly, this was a home alone type situation where some guy was squatting in nice homes, counting on the fact that people won't be home for the holidays and possibly decided to have some fun with this family once he was spotted. I seriously doubt this single guy was planning to actually take on a family of six plus adults. I have not stayed alone in the house since, as the dog I used to watch passed away some time ago. I would love to hear your thoughts slash reactions. Not as crazy as some people's stories but was such a terrifying experience for me. So, a small bit of background. I'm from a small rural town set in the East Midlands in the UK, and everything is quite spread out. My mum lived on a small street on the edge of town, tucked up into the corner, with very little lighting from street lights at the time, the council turned some off in certain areas to save money. The street was a dead end, and shaped like a T, with my mum living at the dead end at the top on the left. I'm also about 5 feet 2 inches and weighed about 105 pounds at the time. The incident happened on Christmas Eve, in 2011, so I was only 21. I was visiting home from my university up north for Christmas and had gone out with some friends from the area for a catch-up and to celebrate the season. It had gotten late and I needed to catch a taxi to get home. I didn't want to call my mom at 1am Christmas morning to come and pick me up, and it was too far to walk. My friends had all headed home, as they lived much closer to the town center. Unfortunately, I hadn't realized that the taxis were all charging double fares because it was Christmas, and had only saved £10, the usual amount it would cost me to get back rather than the 20 pounds it was going to cost me that night. I didn't have my bank card, silly, I know, and thought that I was going to have to wake my mum up after all, when one driver pointed out that it was Christmas, so he would do it for the 10 pounds. He leant over and opened the passenger door and I climbed in. Now, in the UK, black hackney cabs don't really take passengers in the front seat, you're meant to sit in the back area normally. I was drunk and honestly just grateful for the ride, and didn't think anything of it. I gave him the street name and we set off. He seemed very friendly, asking how my night had been, what my Christmas plans were, and just regular chatter. 
At some point I mentioned that I was visiting from university and he asked what I was studying, to which I replied motorsport engineering. At this point, he became fascinated with me and what I was studying. He kept making comments about how he would never have imagined a girl as young and beautiful as me would be interested in cars, how amazing that was, that he thought it was incredible, etc etc. I thought it was odd, but I'd had some weird reactions when people found out what I did before, I apparently don't look like an engineer, whatever that looks like, so I just smiled and nodded to keep things friendly, as we were nearly on my street. Then things got a bit weird. We pulled up in my street, a few doors down from my house and of course, it was super dark. I'm drunk, tired, and a bit creeped out by his obsession with me and what I study at this point, he's still going on about how he never would have believed it, I was too pretty for that, he would love to see me working on cars, etc., so I just try to give him the money and get out. But he won't take it, just ignores my hand waving the money around, and keeps talking. He had also learned a lot closer at this point. I tried the door handle to let myself out, but the locks were engaged and I couldn't find any way of unlocking it in the dark. He completely ignored my attempts to open the door and just kept talking to me. I can't remember everything he said anymore, mostly he carried on the same way he had been, but with more references to watching me bend over. I was really freaked out by this point, and had tried to say that I needed to go several times but he just kept ignoring me, and saying he loved how incredible I was. He didn't even know me. We'd been sitting in the dark at the end of my street for about half an hour at that point, with his engine and lights off. There was no way anyone from the houses would have even been able to tell there was anyone in the car if they had looked out of their windows. Then I saw a light turn on in my next door neighbor's window, up the street from us, and blurted out, oh that must be my mum waiting up for me, I better head in before she calls and starts to worry. The look on his face was genuinely terrifying, he looked like a combination of angry, disappointed and also contemplative, like he was trying to decide something. I waved my money at him again and pulled on the door handle and he popped the locks and let me out. I ran all the way to my front door and let myself in, before locking everything behind me, and peeking out the curtains. He didn't drive away for another few minutes, and I remember being aware that he saw me go into my house, and also must have known that I lied about the light being my mum, it wasn't even my house. I never saw him again and went back to university four days later. I told my mum what happened and she insisted on driving me around for the rest of my stay. To this day I still get nervous taking taxis and always message someone when I have to use one so that they know where I am and when to expect me. So creepy taxi driver, let's not meet. I was 23 when I started working full time at everyone's favorite supermarket. I had struggled through over three years of college before deciding to get a full time job and had worked a trial full time job for six months before becoming a greeter a year before it was changed to something more serious. I look younger than I am and people have asked if I was still in high school or if I had a boyfriend, and I was ignorant enough to be used to those questions under a work environment. I also have anxiety, so I worried about customer service more than my own comfort zone most of the time in that position. I soon started to keep work journals detailing what I saw on a daily basis or anything I found suspicious, which came in handy for me in my opinion. There was this older gentleman that needed to use an electric cart to get around an EFS that I helped from time to time since I normally watched the secondary doors. He introduced himself as L, claimed to be in his 70s, and required the electric cart because of all the smoking he did since his younger years. L normally would strike up long conversations about his life after he was done shopping that he would stay at least another 5 or so minutes before leaving, including asking if I had a boyfriend and, at one time, making up scenarios of meeting a potential boyfriend. As stated before, I was used to hearing the boyfriend question so much that I stick with saying, I don't have a boyfriend and I'm not looking to find one anytime soon. I took this as me lying to get out of the situation when I was telling the truth. I also overlooked a lot of what he said most of the time because it was normally loud when these conversations happened. He had a rasp to his voice, which was proof of the smoking information he told me, and I thought they were things that were the norm from his time. As a retail worker, I felt it would have been rude if I ignored him and it gave a reason to think that I was his friend. I didn't start seeing red flags about his behavior until late November 2018 when he told me that I looked pretty and that he wouldn't imagine me naked. It made me uncomfortable, but I awkwardly thanked him for the compliment and he went about his shopping before I documented it down. Red flag number two came a month later, the day after Christmas and sometime after my birthday. Earlier that day, I was talking to fellow greeter Tom, a male in his mid-fifties about when Greeter Queenie would let us go on our breaks after empty dew spilled when I came in to do his shopping, and after he was done and I was helping him transfer groceries to a push cart, he said he saw me talking to Tom in a monotone sounding voice and left without going into a conversation. 
was enough to scare me. Red flag number three came not even a week into the new year. Al came back to do some shopping and tried to strike up a conversation with me after he was done, but noticed how I was trying to focus on my job more than him. This prompted him to ask if he made me uncomfortable, and I told Al I didn't want to be rude as I thought telling him would make him upset at the time. Al told me that he sees me as a friend and that whenever he comes in, he looks to see if I'm working because I'm the friendliest greeter compared to everyone else before he left. I could tell he wanted to put me at ease, but it did the opposite as I found I was right to be paranoid about him. I started to actively avoid Al if I ever saw him again and was alone at either door, acting like I was busy and having an assistant manager switch me and Queenie to different doors whenever the two of us worked alone in the morning. It worked for a month until greeter Nora came and gave Queenie her breaks when she wanted them. Come February, I'm gathering baskets when I spot Al at the register that sells tobacco and he says, hi, to me, but I ignored him and hurried away. I later asked one of my managers to use the restroom and hid in there until I couldn't hear him. Self-checkout host Dory had noticed how uncomfortable I was as Al recounted that he thought he might have insulted me because he asked if I had a boyfriend. He then told her everything he was saying to me and Dory understood why I was so uncomfortable. She later told me that Al was very vocal about me ignoring him until he left. I told two other co-workers as I was trying to catch up in my journaling as I had fallen behind in it, and they told me to escalate the situation to the head of loss prevention, Rebecca. I eventually did once I had three entries written down and marked as my evidence, and told Rebecca what I had been doing to avoid Al. I was afraid to tell anyone in management without any evidence as I was worried I'd be brushed off as an anxious worker, but Rebecca took me seriously and said I was doing the right thing by avoiding him. Since my journaling included times and dates, I was able to give Rebecca the time frame Al was most commonly coming into shop at the time, sometime between 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., closer to the end of the month, and mainly Sundays. With that in mind, I was told to keep an eye out whenever Elle ever came back in and to point him out to her or her team as his actions could lead to sexual harassment of the customers as well. In March, I was surprised to see all come in at a later time and act more professional around me, keeping things to hello and goodbye instead of trying to make conversation. Even with the change of attitude, I still kept my guard up. Near the end of the month, around 6.50 at night, Al stated how nice the weather was and asked me if I could help him out to his car with his groceries so I could take the electric cart back inside. It's EFS's policy that the electric carts stay inside to avoid any damage to them unless the customer physically can't get to the store without heavy assistance, so I politely said he had to use a push cart as the electric cart can't go outside and I'd get him one. Al was a bit insistent in taking the electric cart out and was halfway through the entryway but I pushed the push cart close to the electric cart and politely insisted that the electric cart stay inside to avoid getting damaged from pebbles and dust that could get into the cart. Al relented for that reason, had his groceries put into the push cart and left. I was relieved that the situation hadn't escalated so I had to help him, but I did take note of his car should I get an idea to try and follow me home. That was also the only time he ever asked for me to help him outside. I eventually told Nora that I didn't feel comfortable around Al and she said that I wasn't the only young woman he had said these things to, as he said things like this to other female workers at other EFSs since Nora had transferred over from the west location in the city. A little over halfway into April, I switched over to cashiering and put together more information about Al's visits so I could try to avoid serving him by myself, coming in around the time food stamps were replenished and within the 7-10 to 10 days at the end of the month, mainly on Sundays and Fridays and during the 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. time frames. Luckily enough, I didn't see out after the switch. Even more coincidentally at the start of May, I found an online article by the local newspaper with a picture of who looked to be Al in my Twitter timeline. I didn't want to get my assumptions up and had Nora look at the picture two days later. To my shock, Nora confirmed it was Al, reading the article revealed that Al had spilled gravy on his laptop and took it into Popular Electronics to get the files recovered when the IT people found what appeared to be illicit pictures of children during the recovery and called the police. Al admitted to saving the photos and was able to describe what he saved and was arrested. The article also revealed that Al wasn't his real name, that he was really in his mid-fifties, and was from a nearby city in Iowa, which explained why he mainly came in on weekends. I told everyone that knew the story and they were equally shocked, but also relieved. I did research on estate laws on the charges against Al a few days after his scheduled court appearance and found that he was guaranteed at least 2 to 10 years in prison at the least an immediate registration as a sex offender. In October, I decided to do more research as it had been months and found more articles confirming that Al copped a plea deal for 2 years and over $600 in fines for each count against him and was sentenced in September. I had switched to another position on the sales floor by the time I found out about the sentencing. 
It's been over two years since then and I have my old co-workers and Rebecca to thank for giving me the fact and confidence that I do have the option to tell a customer no if I feel something isn't right, but I can't help but think about how badly things could have gotten if I had helped him out to his car and if he had other intentions in mind. It should also be noted that any electric car policies are put in place not only to maintain the functionality of the car, but to also protect the employees from injury or other harm at any store electric carts are provided and I was lucky to enforce this policy when I did.